good evening once again and uh, I'm back on stage this time with a very esteemed panel, very diverse panel I would say because we have somebody who's investing in the healthcare space and other uh, technological innovations in India. We have somebody who uh, leads a, a, a large hospital chain and a pan-India presence and uh, ma'am here uh, is working in the gynecology space in fertility and IVF and she's the founder and director of Origin Fertility and IVF. We have Dr. Anubam Sibyl who's from Apollo Hospital and Anand Karat who's with TH Healthcare and Life Sciences. So very diverse panel and we are talking about you know, catalyzing the next wave of growth. <clears throat> and I think this panel is best place to answer that because when it comes to investment, when it comes to uh, the innovation that we're having in the healthcare space, I think this is the panel that can uh, you know, answer that. So I think first, just to start off with, I'd like to ask each one of you the same question here. Like, how can healthcare uh, leverage telemedicine, digital health, since we're at that stage right now, you know, uh, in fact, the previous panel mentioned that without digital, we cannot really progress. Um, how can we leverage that to actually get healthcare down to the underserved areas? If I could start with you, Dr. Sibyl, and then come to ma'am. Oh, well, thank you. Thank you so much for uh, inviting me to this panel. Uh, I think great point to get this uh, conversation going. I mean, if you look at the world around us, you know, there's tech everywhere, right? Um, you know, if you look at what UPI has done, yeah. the fact that, you know, nearly 46% of all transactions in the world uh, happened in India in 2022, the fact that more than a dozen countries are adopting that, and how it has changed the way people interact with vendors, the way they interact with the whole, uh, you know, purchase mechanism has changed. Uh, if we look at, uh, you know, travel, if we, I mean, look at the Jiyatra, I mean, how convenient it is, you skip the line. If you look at banking, if you look at every aspect of life, I think clearly tech is very much a part of our everyday existence. Yeah. And there is no reason why tech shouldn't be a part of day-to-day -day healthcare delivery. Because we cannot, cannot um, deny the fact that we're a very large country. We have like 650,000 villages. How are we going to provide healthcare there? Now, if you look at the data consumption, look at OECD versus India. India is two and a half times uh, per month per, per data user. So clearly, we are consuming data. We yeah. need to effectively use the connectivity to reach out to every citizen in the country. And there are some amazing examples. If you look at East and Jeevni, I mean, yeah. I think it's a, it's a game changer. Uh, we at Apollo have now, what, 16 million tele-medicine um, consults, uh, from running e-pharmacies to running an urban health program uh, with the government in Andhra Pradesh to tele-ophthalmology. Tele-pathology, you know, there are as many as 13 specialties in pathology. So if you have an expert in kidney pathology and you're not going to have hundreds in the country, why shouldn't we, scan, we be scanning sc uh, slides digitally and getting someone in Chennai to report for someone in, in uh, Srinagar? Yeah. Uh, Tele-cardiology, uh, tele-radiology. Uh, why shouldn't we use WhatsApp more effectively? So, you know, somebody has a stroke. Um, there is a CT there, but there isn't a neurologist because you're not going to have enough neurologists for a country our size. Well, the CT is uploaded on WhatsApp. A neurologist looks at it and says, hey, listen, this is ischemic stroke. Let me walk you through on how to thrombolize that, that clot. And it's happening. So I think technology really needs to be embraced. And we in healthcare need to work at a faster pace because I think other industries, other sectors have gone ahead and have moved on. Uh, we in healthcare have been a little tardy, and, and there are reasons for that, because we're dealing with life and death, and we need to be cautious. But I think COVID taught us a lot. Uh, the fact that telemedicine guidelines were laid out, the fact yeah. that there's an ecosystem today uh, that, that has faith and patience. You know, when we used to talk about telemedicine, and, I, and you know, I'm a practicing clinician, I'm a pediatrician. When we would talk about, hey, listen, you're in and soul, and you, know, you have autoimmune hepatitis, and when I yeah. see your reports every three months, I don't need to physically see you, they'd say, no, no, no. But now, post-COVID, they're very happy to do a consult. You save time, you save money, you save energy, you save resources. Because see, nobody travels alone in India. Yeah. Four people travel. So just imagine the cost. So I think um, telemedicine is a game changer. Telehealth technology is a game changer, whether it's AI, ML. Uh, looking at chest x-rays in villages where there is no radiologist to make a diagnosis of tuberculosis happening today. 
and I think uh, the the opportunities are huge. Right. Um, Ma'am, if I come to you, in women's health again, this like, is a very important area, especially in healthcare and getting it down to rural India. Uh, how, how do we reach out? Yeah. So if I especially talk about the fertility scene, there is, has been a very big urban and rural divide. Yes. I mean, up till now, even just before, maybe just five, seven years before, there were hardly eight metro cities of India who had good IVF centers. Forget about villages, not Tier 3. Tier 3 may not be reached IVF. Tier 2 cities also didn't have IVF centers. Being fertility needs so much of such a big country where social fabric is so important uh, and millions and millions of couples are suffering from infertility. If I'm talking about from that aspect, so people from villages, they come really, really late to us. They come 15 years later after marriage, 20 years later. Imagine if they can get that guidance right at the beginning in their village if there are telemedicine centers there is a you know it's just the just the problem of distance mm -hmm. and time coming to this ivf specialist or coming to the infertility specialist so yes of course it can be a game changer and it is actually happening so we we are seeing a lot of patients now now with the digital revolution with the social revolution social media revolution we are getting a lot of patients from interiors of india from very very remote parts of india who are connecting to us digitally. But if this can happen at really big scale with a government partnership, with telemedicine centers at every uh, nook and corner of India, not only in the fertility, but otherwise in so many diseases can be treated right. sitting yeah. at uh, just one place. Right, right. Uh, Anand, the first to come to you, um, what kind of, uh, since you all are, you know, working with various companies, uh, various uh, professionals also here, have you seen any innovation that's come out in this space in reaching out to, uh, you know, rural India in your portfolio? Uh, first of all, thank you uh, for, for inviting us and happy to be part of this uh, esteemed panel. Uh, uh, coming to the uh, question, right, so in the last five, seven years, right, and, and obviously the panelists have correctly pointed out that COVID propelled it, right, the digitization that has happened in the country in general, along with the need of the hour also, right? That was there to, you know, digitize and, and reach out to people uh, digitally, right? That has changed the way probably healthcare has been delivered or seen in, in the country. We have seen people raising billions of dollars in the country, whether it's telemedicine, whether it is e-pharmacies, uh, to deliver that to the nation, right? And I think this will only, uh, this will only go strongly uh, in the years to come. Because you have to realize we are a, we are a country of 1.4 billion people, which means that we are probably a continent in itself, right? Mm. And to reach to every nook and corner of this country physically is at times difficult and, and practically also impossible, right? So digitization and, uh, you know, taking things digitally is the way to go. Uh, in the next few years, I feel a lot of innovations is happening in, in let's say, delivering uh, medicines uh, in a very very innovative way so we are we were at a conference in Singapore and we were seeing people delivering drug medicines to uh, to you know brains using non incision processes right these are obviously at clinical 2a and clinical 3 but okay. probably in the next couple of years few years it, it will come to the forefront right so that those kind of innovations probably is what the country needs uh, we we consume data like anything and i think uh, that's the next wave of growth in probably women's health in or let's say general healthcare will right. be uh, along with you know digital tech and all of that uh, ai will also you know be be part of the forefront in the last probably year uh, of the 100 companies that were started uh, in india 20% were doing something with ai 20% of them were doing something more digitally uh, so I think those will take. You, you mentioned AI. AI is, a, is an area which is not very well understood right now. At least, you know, uh, among the larger population, it's, it's a buzzword right now, yeah. right? So, uh, since you touched upon AI, I'd like to bring that AI question in here. AI in healthcare, especially you know, delivering healthcare in uh, rural areas and all that. Um, what are the opportunities? Maybe like a first consult, may have common symptoms, uh, Wikipedia so, kind of answers. So what? if you look at generally, uh, when you go to any telemed website or let's say e-pharmacy website, right, there is the chatbot that's there, right? Yeah. So there are a few trigger words. If you if you type them, probably they'll, they'll tell you, let's say you have X, Y, Z, and probably you can do A, B, C of, out of it, right? 
plus what ai is also doing now is a lot of these clinical trials that are happening which obviously takes a lot of time because there are lab trials there are clinical trials and then there are human trials and an animal trials involved the lab trials and the initial phases can be done with a lot of uh, you know ai help where they can probably fast track the process right obviously uh, there will be cases where there will be trial and error but uh, i think that's the way to go right and and globally whether it's korea whether it's japan australia they are they're spending a lot of money in developing these niche software technologies which probably predict uh, the outcome of a drug far more efficiently in let's say hypothetically 10 days than probably a two month trial right so right. that that narrows down the process also a little bit and uh, is more predictable probably more improvements in the future as well yeah uh, dr sapal if i have to come to you um are you using AI in uh, the Apollo group? So we have a very vibrant uh, AI team and uh, they've been sort of doing this for now about five years. And I'll just give you a few examples of some of the work that's been done. It's uh, empirical use of antibiotics based on uh, data uh, that has been studied. For example, your PIN code 110024 and you come to hospital with what is a community acquired pneumonia. So what would you do? You would use an antibiotic, but you wouldn't be very sure what is the likely bug and what would be the sensitivity pattern. Right. So using AI, looking at the data that we have, you can predict, okay, the most likely bug from this pin code is, say, for example, mycoplasma and the antibiotic that works is azithromycin. Right. So based on that, you will put in, in the prescription, the antibiotic that is most likely to work rather than wait for two days to get a report. This is one example. Uh, you have pre-diabetes based on uh, algorithms that we've developed. What is the likelihood of developing diabetes? Um, you have breast cancer. What is the likelihood of getting a recurrence? Mm -hmm. uh, you have uh, obstructive pulmonary disease. What is the likelihood of worsening? Right. So there, there are about 20 tracks that we are currently working on. Uh, and, you know, for COVID, we had an AI COVID uh, score that, you know, that I think it had 16 million downloads. Okay. For cardiovascular risk, we have a predictor. What is the likelihood in 10 years for you to develop coronary artery disease? Because a lot of this work was done based on some studies that were done in Massachusetts uh, many decades ago, the Framingham study. But uh, that was Caucasian. For Indian predictors, you know, what is based on our lipid profile, based on our eating habits and so right. on, what is the likelihood? So, you know, big data using AI, using ML is something that we uh, at Apollo have been very actively engaged in. And I think the list of projects keeps increasing every fortnight or so. Okay, interesting. Uh, coming to the uh, healthcare workforce in India, now there's a projection that we'd probably be short of, uh, you know, a lot of healthcare workers in the years to come, given the size of our population and the demand that we have. Um, how can we bridge this gap? I mean, um, if you're, especially when you're looking at taking healthcare down to tier two, tier three cities and all that, there's a need for more, say, phlebotomists and uh, your technicians, lab technicians. How do we bridge this gap? Um, how are we getting more talent into the industry? Because the projections say that it's a $700 billion opportunity. How are we doing that? Can, can we start with you and then take it down? Yeah. So regarding, uh, uh, first of all, the updation of the knowledge, I think webinars yeah. are doing fantastic, especially in the <coughs> medical sector nowadays, like hardly any me physical meets, but webinars are doing wonderful job for upskilling the already trained workers. So many webinars happening every time, every week, every whosoever doctor or nurse or paramedic wants to listen to one particular topic, wants to upgrade himself or herself, that kind of digital is revolution is already happening. I think it started happening from COVID times. Regarding the upskilling, yes, a lot of uh, digital uh, education uh, investment can definitely help in that because there is a lot of medical education which can happen digitally. So, um, uh, you know, uh, rather than uh, a person attending, uh, let's say, an FNB course for two years or, uh, uh, you know, it may be really good to have one year of digital uh, sitting at home um, education and then maybe one year of practical education. So that kind of uh, courses, of course, need to be uh, upgraded. So, uh, so in the years when there was no embryology course available throughout India, there was this course uh, which was being offered by Leeds University in UK. It is still there, MSc in embryology. So that was a fantastic course. From sitting in UK, you could do it. 
We could do that for two years of MSc fellowship, MSc in embryology for a niche course for which there was no specialist, hardly counting maybe 10, 15 embryologists were available around 10 years back in India. But we could do that sitting uh, at, in India and just going for maybe just one month to UK. So that kind of revolution, yes, can happen. Okay. So, you know, let's, let's look at uh, some of the data points that we have. 43% of our population is less than 25. Uh, healthcare is considered very prestigious, so there's a lot of interest. Uh, if you look at uh, the MBBN entrance exam for last year, for 108,000 uh, seats, there were 20.38 lakh class 12 students who had enrolled. This year, it's already 25 lakhs. So that is the kind of interest that uh, young boys and girls have in medicine. Now. 24 lakhs are not going to become doctors, right? One lakh will. So they would want to be a part of the healthcare sort of delivery system. So some of them might want to become nurses, they might want to become technicians, they might want to uh, become managers and so on and so forth. So healthcare is, is uh, very popular. Uh, if we look at the old age uh, dependency ratio, you know, people older than 64, and we compare that to the working population, um, in Japan, it's 50%. In India, it's 10%. What really this means in that the decades to come, in fact, starting a few years from now, we will have a billion people in the workforce for the next five decades. And by 2047, 21% 20, of the world's workforce is going to be in India, yeah. from India. So there is a huge opportunity because there's going to be a global shortage. The World Health Organization estimates that 20, by 2035, there'll be about 12.9 million healthcare professionals short. So let's first clear this myth that we have a shortage. We don't. The World Health Organization says one per thousand. We are at one plus for 856 already. In the last nine years, the medical MBBS seats have doubled. The postgraduate seats are more than doubled. Medical colleges from over 380 are like 700 plus. There are more that are going to get uh, approved. So we will produce enough for India and for the world. Right. So this, there is a huge potential for us to be able to actually become the healthcare capital in terms of providing expertise. You know, quite often when you talk to someone in the West and they say, oh, you, have, you know, we want nurses and doctors from India, but what will happen to your country? And I say, listen, don't worry about our country. We're we good. Is enough. We will export expertise and do this with a sense of pride. We will, we will manage our own needs, but also take care of your needs. So just to give you an example, we've sent a thousand nurses and doctors to the United Kingdom, radiographers, because they have a shortage and we are able to produce enough. We need to be producing enough and we must meet the aspirations of the young Indian today who really wants everything out there for their family and for themselves. And they're, they, you know, they're adaptable, uh, they adjust very well, they pick up languages. After all, there are Indians everywhere in the world other than three countries. So why not? Yeah. <coughs> <coughs> and the reverse is also true, right? Uh, just to continue with you, the, yeah. the reverse is also true where um, patients globally are looking at uh, India as a destination for uh, medical treatment now. Well, absolutely. Uh, I mean, you know, uh, you would recollect maybe 30, 40 years ago, um, you know, leaders would go for a bypass surgery to, to the United States and, and now look at it that, you know, India performs more than 300,000 open heart surgeries every year. We have patients from more than 160 countries. And why is that? Because uh, one, uh, we have the expertise. Two, we have the technology. And the third, most important factor that someone considers is the cost. Right. Now, let me give you a, a, an interesting example. Uh, many of you would have seen the film Gravity. Cost $100 million to make, right? What was the cost of Mars? Our f the first mission in the world to reach the orbit of Mars in its maiden attempt? 73 million dollars. A year later, Interstellar was made, cost 160 million dollars. What was the cost of Chandrayaan? 74 or 75 million dollars. So we understand frugal innovation. So when people choose, they look at all of this. And our costs are one fifth to one tenth of what they are in, in, say, in the United States. So we are very attractive as a destination. And uh, I think. Uh, in the last uh, decade or so, we've seen a lot of traction, and I think in the years to come, 
uh, we will become the preferred destination for, for these reasons. Right. Uh, yeah, Anath, if I to come to you, um, so uh, taking off from what Dr. Subal just said, India as a destination, uh, where do you see, uh, the uh, what areas do you see we need to develop in the healthcare space where you are seeing more uh, demand for investment coming in? So, uh, if, you, if you look at holistically, I think healthcare delivery, as, as doctor said, is, is fairly established, right? So, there was $5 billion that was pumped in last year private capital in healthcare delivery, uh, which is a decent amount of money, right? And these are people who are global, who have, who have seen the world still coming to India, right? What, what, has, what has changed in the last couple of years is that the whole boom that happened with, let's say, teleconsulting, digital consulting, right? The companies are still there, by the way, right? It's just that the valuations have, have taken, you know, more realistic picture, right? These are, these are the companies that, that were probably subscale five years back, but are now at, at a very large scale. We've seen that happening at, at you know, uh, food delivery, right? Where Blinkit, Zomato, these were pretty, pretty small companies and, and now they are, they are mammoths, right? The same thing will be replicated in something in healthcare, right? Because it is only natural progression. The amount of data we consume as a country is humongous, right? And it's not only coming from tier one and metro cities. The bulk of that data is coming also from tier two, tier three cities, right? Where these guys are now more comfortable with using a mobile phone, uh, more comfortable with using a smartphone as well. And we've seen that with our, our parents, our grandparents as well, right? My, my dad is more comfortable using uh, an online delivery app to order his medicines on his own than he was probably three years back. I think these innovations have silently happened and probably we have ignored them because they have happened so silently and so quickly. These generally take probably years or decades to happen in, in global globally, right? I mean, uh, our healthcare records, uh, one thing which has, which has actually lagged globally where it's, it's still physical, a chunk of it, if that can be digitized and created, you know, uh, one national directory where I know my healthcare records for, let's say, 10 years to come are, you know, safe uh, and all of that. And that, again, can be used, uh, you know, on a no-name basis, protecting all the privacy and all of that, right? Uh, to do all these AL, AI ML stuff where you can predict, let's say, in, 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 in my genes or people having in my genes, what are the probably typical disease, diseases that we'll have, right? And this is where people like us, Indians, are very smart. We know how to do Jugaad, right? So this is where uh, the world will look up to us because we've seen how superbly digitized our, our COVID process was, where we still have digital, uh, you know, records of everything, right? And I don't... It's difficult, but I think in a country like India where uh, the population is so big, it, it comes as a challenge as well, but it, it's a blessing as well, right? That you can use the population and, and there are brilliant minds out there. I mean, uh, the, the top global tech companies are headed by Indians, right? Which means that the mind is there, the quality is there, as, as doctor said. It's just that we need to make sure that we utilize them properly and, and uh, they, are, they are given enough motivation to be in India as well, right? Uh, because as much as we would love to be, let's say, the healthcare partner to the globe, we are the healthcare pharmacy to the globe, right? Uh, we would love to uh, push these guys to remain in India, serve our country as well, right? And a collective duty for all of us, including us, the government as well, everyone, to do it. And I think it's a matter of time in the next three, five years where this will take off and these digitization, I think healthcare records digitization is, is the next big thing that should be focused on. It's important. Uh, the other aspects are, are fairly developed, fairly scaled up. Uh, it's just a matter of time where they stabilize and make profits and, and become, you know, bigger mammoths in the time to come. Interesting you mentioned uh, healthcare record digitization. Uh, you think that's something that can happen in the n near future? And because if someone gets a consultation, like in some uh, village somewhere, and then comes to another hospital and then there's no, you know, record sharing. Do you think that there's a way in which it, this can all be unified? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, if you look at Ayushman Bharat and you look at Abha, uh, you know, that's the whole intent, uh, you know, to have your digital Correct. health record that moves with you. Uh, you also have uh, a registry for all healthcare providers and you also have a prov professional health registry for all the, the doctors and healthcare professionals. So there's some traction, but I think we need to scale that up a bit and that will happen if people realize the benefits of that. 
and and I think it's about creating awareness. And just like you know, UPI became so popular because people could see the benefit every single day. Now in healthcare, you don't want to have to access your health records so frequently because you want to be healthy. Everybody wants to be healthy. So we have to change the narrative in saying, listen, let's sort of make that account. It makes a lot of sense to have it. Everyone needs to be educated about the benefits of this. It will happen. Uh, I mean, the fact is that we have Aadhaar, we have the largest biometric ID system in the world, right? The fact that we have records of, uh, you know, everyone who had the COVID vaccine available at the click of a button. So, you know, we, we have the ability to do that. We have the ability to innovate. I think we have to get the end users, which is all of us, to, uh, to, to have an open mind in terms of, hey, listen, it makes sense to do this. Yeah, speaking about the end user, I mean, <coughs> data privacy is a concern here with Aadhaar and ABA as well, as well. Aadhaar, you already know where I live and, you know, who I am, all of that. And with ABA, you'll also know what diseases I have and what, you know, ailments I have. So, data privacy is a big concern over here, which is probably one of the things that have to be addressed. Yes. Uh, what do you think needs to be done there? Well, I think we, we as you know, that you know, there's there's a lot of uh, sort of uh, focus on that in terms of preventing uh, access of this information. Um, privacy is being talked about. You know, there, there's legislation in terms of how do we uh, put in the safeguards, how do we put in the firewalls. So I think. Very, very important points that need to be addressed, and I'm pretty certain that they will. Um, yeah. Um, speaking about, I mean, the other part of it is the delivery uh, between private and public partnerships to, you know, get these things going, uh, growing at scale. What do you think needs to be done in, especially in the, uh, you know, the, the women's health space, to get this down to the grassroots? So actually, a lot needs to be done. Uh, if you look at the healthcare sector in India, almost 78 to 80 percent of the healthcare needs of the citizen is being taken care of by, thankfully, now very good private sector. But hardly 20 to 25 percent healthcare needs is being taken care of by the government. So here there is a very big divide. So we are talking about bringing uh, uh, lots of uh, patients from outside country and uh, making really nice five-star fancy hospitals, super rich hospital, that's all fine. That's all okay, we can do it. But what about our own population? If we go to any government hospital, um, it really needs lots and lots of upgradation. So there comes the need of public and private partnership, which I think Delhi government somehow started somewhere when they were not able to take the load of CT scans and MRIs. So there was this dark scheme, which they have started or uh, you know accident uh, at the first yeah. though you know that there was this yeah. yeah so that kind of uh, number one government definitely needs to really scale up their investment in the healthcare sector still the healthcare investment is very very low part of our overall uh, budget and that is sad because if you look at any government hospital i mean i wouldn't like to any, go to any government hospital looking at the crowd looking at the I mean, all the instruments are there, especially in Delhi and everything, but there's so much of crowd and so much of, you know, there's just a one doctor taking care of 500 OPD, that's not humanly possible. So a lot of investment needs to go from the government side to those hospitals, to the government facilities, so that cheap access to the people who cannot afford can yeah. go, right? And yeah. here comes the role of public-private partnership, partnership, where the government is not able to cope up with the load of the population, then maybe with the partnership of the uh, private sector, right. they can start. Especially in the IVF sector, if I talk about, I being an IVF specialist, I, you know, my mind always goes to that. There's no insurance. There's no CGHS cover. There's no DGHS cover. So, and and it, doesn't, it, it doesn't happen that the gynae problem or the infertility problem doesn't happen in the poor. There are so many poor people. And this is such an expensive treatment. There are hardly any government hospital around India. You know, you can count them on fingers. That to just now, in just two, three years, that is, you know, IVF is available to the poor people. Right. So, yeah, there, there, there needs to be a lot of collaboration. So the need for reform in terms of what all is covered yes. as well, including in the insurance space, but that's a whole new topic to yes. talk about as well. Uh, Dr. Sibyl, if, uh, if I was to come to you, uh, the need for uh, public-private partnerships, how do we drive them? Well, uh, you know, again, uh, if we look back at uh, the silos that have historically existed, but some of those silos did start to break during COVID. And let me give you two or three examples. 
If you look at the ICU beds and you look at the ventilator, you know, beds with ventilators, you know, the ratio was about 60% private, 40% public. If you look at the labs that were testing, it was about half and half. When it came to vaccination, 97% was government, right? So we started thinking about one health service. Right. Silos were broken. And I think we need to build on that because we have to work together. The fact that, you know, there are about 150,000 uh, wellness centers now is fantastic because you really do need to work towards keeping people out of hospitals. You know, if you have this panel 10 years from now, we will be looking at not very large hospitals. People will come in only when they need to come in. A lot of the things will be done outside and later on at home. Uh, procedures will be done by minimal access, uh, which means that the average length of stay from what used to be six or seven days would be down to 24 to 48 hours. Let me give you an example. I mean, we have a minimal access uh, cardiac surgery program where after a trip, um, you know, a double vessel bypass, the patient goes home in 48 hours. So, you know, the more you embrace robotics, the more you start doing things minimally invasive, you will be able to free beds. Nobody wants to go to a hospital. And I think we in healthcare need to make sure that we don't get people into hospital. So we really need to start looking at primary prevention. We need to look at secondary prevention. We need to look at early diagnosis. We need to start looking at screening. We need to pick up conditions a lot earlier. What is the point of picking up uh, the fact that someone has hypertension when he's had it for 10 years and now, or 15 years and now his kidneys have been impacted? It should have been picked up 15 years ago. Right. Or what is the point of picking up uh, a fatty liver when we have fibrosis, it could have been picked up a decade earlier. The, the problem that we have is that we don't think about prevention, we don't think about visiting a doctor when we are healthy. Now, if I were to ask everyone, when was the last time you had, uh, you had your vehicle serviced? Everybody will say in the last six months and I'd say, when was the last time you visited a doctor when you were healthy? not more than 5% of people will raise their hand. Yes, I, I saw a doctor when I had a flu and I had a raging fever. Of course, you didn't have a choice. But did you go and see a doctor to say, hey, listen, check me out and say, is there anything wrong with me so that I can fix it now? We need to move towards prevention. We need to manage non-communicable diseases through early intervention. We need to pe keep people out of hospitals. Yeah, in fact, it's a good thing you brought up uh, preventive healthcare as one of the uh, subjects to talk about because I think a lot needs to be done on that front in terms of educating the public, getting annual, like you gave the example of servicing your car, you, you, you get calls from the service station saying, your car is due for service, due for service, due for service, come in. But does the hospital they keep calling you saying like you're you, you But if you call, out? then you'll be blamed saying, listen, listen, why are you nagging me? Exactly. <laughs> so it has to come from within. We have to give more importance to our own healthcare. But you know, nobody wants to be uh, fall ill, which is fine. And if you hear of someone who's got a stroke, you say, oh, no, it happened to him because of this. It's not going to happen to me. You know, we, we all have this artificial aura of protection that right. we assume will not happen to us. But we have to realize that anyone can fall ill. And if there are risk factors uh, in the family, there's family history of a particular illness, we need to be more serious. I mean, you know, individuals at 30 should be having an annual medical check. Yeah. They really should. You'll be surprised at the number of young women we see with breast cancer in their 20s. It is not a disease of the 40s and the 50s. You'll be surprised at the number of people we see with heart disease in their 30s. It is not a disease of the 50s and the 60s. Yeah. Right. No, yeah, you wanted to add to that? Yeah, uh, the very important point. Uh, I would just like to give a guiding example here of the pap smear. So cervical cancer being the number one killer of uh, women, number one cancer, female cancer in India, whenever we get patients from outside, they will always tell us there is a mandatory annual pap smear checkup. And that's a fantastic cancer, which you can detect 20 years earlier, which you can say that you are going to develop it 20 years later. I mean, you can prevent a cancer before it has developed. And still pap smear screening, I see nowhere. Right. Even the doctors, I mean, we really have to tell the patient that, you know, get it done, get it done. So there, there should be educative programs regarding the preventive health care, like, you know, polio vaccination. Vaccinations have so done wonders. Yeah. So similar kind of training programs. This year they had the cervical, education, yeah, cervical education. cancer vaccine. Cervical cancer vaccines. Pap smear is very important. Breast cancer rising so drastically. We Day in and day out we get patients where they are coming to preserve their eggs. 
in a very young age wherein they have just been diagnosed with breast cancer. That is so sad. I mean, breast cancer screenings are available. So yes, there should be a public awareness okay. programs. Right, right. Yeah. Anand, your take on this? Preventive so, health care, what should so be done? If you look at, you know, globally, right, how, how let's say, preventive health care or let's say, as doctor pointed out, right, out of hospital care that has been taking care, right? I mean, globally, you would go to a hospital, probably get a surgery and that probably go to a, a post-recovery center, right, to do that, right? It, it was probably non-existent in India five, seven years back, probably 10 years back, but it's picking up, picking up very, very well now, right? Because hospitals also realize that uh, there's a dirt of, let's say, good quality beds available in the country, right? Plus, uh, uh, if you look at financially, the, the most amount of, let's say, uh, profits or money you make out of the, of the patient, right, is when the two days when he's critically required in the hospital, right? Uh, the other days, he can probably go to, go to associated pre or post recovery centers, right? And that is, and that is picking up uh, very, very well, right, in the country. There are, there are many young startups doing it, uh, very well funded by, by large private equity venture capitalist organizations. Uh, so, so those things are probably, uh, you know, going to pick up in the next five, seven years because that's the need of the hour, right? You can't probably put up uh, 20,000 beds every year, private beds, but can you put up 10,000 post-recovery beds? The cost differential is, 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 you know, dramatic, right? To probably put a quality hospital, you would need probably crore and a half per bed of capex, but to put a pre or post, you would probably need 10 lakhs or something or even lesser, right, per bed. So that's the difference. So that's where the money is flowing in now, and, and right. that's happened, along with, uh, you know, PPP partnerships, right, in, in this sector as well. We've seen how how beautifully PPP has done in, in dialysis in the country. I mean, that has worked wonders in, in, in that sector. I think the same can be replicated for, let's say, a pre or post recovery uh, centers as well. And, and that's a model that we've seen that people were apprehensive five years back, but I think people are accepting that Bharat model as well, right, as we call it. Uh, PPP model is, is very, very, uh, highly accepted in dialysis and it can be replicated very very easily to other sectors especially you know infertility where I think the only government probably that uh, does infertility uh, as part of the insurance is probably UK uh, why can't it be part of Ayushman Bharat as well probably slowly slowly we will also develop and and you know realize the importance of it probably because we are 1.4 billion people we don't see the need of infertility treatments but the <laughs> decrease in urban population is a is an issue right, right? So, yeah. Uh, if there are any questions uh, in the audience, also in the room, please feel free to raise your hand and we can just get a couple of questions as well. In So if there are any questions, just raise your hand and you can ask them. Uh, so, yeah, coming back to this, uh, this um, preventive health care uh, and uh, thing being, uh, the other perception that uh, we have is that large hospital chains, and this is why I want to take the question to you, Dr. Sibyl, that large hospital chains, uh, when you go in there, it's, you, you expect to spend an X amount of money, right? Um, but if we had a good preventive healthcare system, probably the, that one visit to the hospital would not be as expensive. So how do we go about doing this education of the public? So, so what is the cost of that preventive health check? You know, what is it? It could be as low as 5,000 rupees or, you know, if it involves saying an, a CT angio, it might be 10,000 or, or 12,000. And if you want to get in because there's family history of cancer, you want a, a you know, whole exome um, genome sequencing, yeah. then it would be additional. So, you know, we have to realize that is this worth spending or not? Uh, a family of four decides to go and watch a film on the weekend and decides to have in some aerated drinks, which is yeah. something that they should avoid, and have some butter-laden popcorn and maybe a samosa or two, which again will of course take them several days to lose the amount of calories and the fat that they've taken in. And the cost of a health check is gonna be that much. It's just a question of prioritizing. It's, it's just a question of opening your mind to the fact that you owe your well-being not just to you, but everyone else in their family. Right. And so it's, it's, it's changing perception, it's about 
awareness and it's about realizing that you need to do this. You need to do this for yourself. Um, in the uh, fertility space also. Now, this is uh, something that's, I think you're, you're dealing with a space where uh, it's not often talked about, especially in rural areas, right? In, in the urban uh, landscape now, it's it's fairly well known. People come to IVF clinics, fertility clinics, it's not a problem. How, how do you go about, uh, you know, educating your uh, kind of patients here? Yeah. So, one comment I wanted to make on that comment. Uh, that we are the most populous, populous country of the world, uh, so we don't need to invest on the infertility. So that's actually not true. Because we are so populous, that's why our population suffering from infertility is also humongous. So there are millions of couples who are suffering from infertility, and we are social, uh, you know, we are, our social fabric is so strong, our families are so strong, that everybody at every uh, occasion, at every party, at every marriage will poke the couple. I mean, the mother, the parents, the era, gera, natu, khera, everybody is going to ask them, when are you giving the good news? And that is such a big social stigma. That yes. is such a big social stigma that patients go into depression, they stop going to the parties, they stop attending any family function. So the need for infertility treatment is huge, huge. And that's why we are seeing such, you know, flourishing of the IVF centers. Thankfully now, earlier even the infrastructure was not so good. The specialists were, uh, you know, you could count them on fingers. But thankfully now that scene is changing and hopefully our needy population will get excess. So uh, regarding the preventive, yes, there's a huge need now for education, especially for, because late marriages are happening, and because of career, there are so many women who come to us, they are in 38, 39, and they have not planned, they have been married for six years, and now they're sitting in front of me, they have been trying just for one month, and not able to conceive. Now they want to go ahead with IVF. Somebody needs to teach them that there is a reproductive age limit for women, and uh, you know, uh, you can't follow the social media that Priyanka Chopra conceived at 40 years, so the, you can produce also at 40 years. So this, this is one need that maybe it should be a school awareness programs. And in our unfertility society, we are doing a lot of school programs where the importance of reproductive age is taught, that having baby at right age is important. This is one, and uh, yeah. Right. That's the prevention that we can do. That catch them at the young age. Second is regarding the IVF, there is still a huge social stigma. Okay. People still do not want to disclose that they are undergoing <coughs> IVF, so that needs to change. Okay. Um, Dr. Sibyl, the next wave of growth that's going to come in in the healthcare space in India, if I have to just sum up now because we yeah, have well, time Well, left. I think we are at a very, very interesting uh, point in, uh, if you look at the progress, you know, when we became independent, a life expectancy was 32. It's 70 now. So we, are, we, are, we have a very young population, so we have to make sure that this young population grows up uh, healthy and remains very productive because we want to be Vixit, but we also want to be Swast in 47. There is yes. no point having to deal with the kind of non-communicable diseases we are dealing with. The second thing that we, we have to uh, uh, do is to start preparing to handle our geriatric population because in the next 25 years, the number of people above the age of 60 and their needs where all these non-communicable diseases then show uh, the effects of end organ damage, uh, where the, the need for healthcare increases many fold compared to what it is in the 40s, we need to prepare ourselves for. Uh, we need to use technology more effectively. We need to make sure that we reach out to everyone in the country through insurance schemes, through, through funding mechanisms so that there's greater access. Right. And while we do all that, we need to make sure that we keep an eye on quality. Because there's no point providing service if it's not of a high standard. And therefore, you know, becoming more and more quality conscious is something that, that all of us need to focus on, whether as healthcare providers, as professionals, or as individuals who are seeking healthcare. Ask 10 questions. Yeah. Why are you doing this? Why not that? And there are several patient rights, and among the patient rights are the ability to question your healthcare provider about what is being done is the best for you at that particular situation at that particular time with that particular condition. And Anant, I'll let you have the last word on this before we wind up. So, uh, from our perspective, I think uh, it's important to understand that uh, 
lot of investment is also required in in sectors which are which are let's say under penetrated so for example pre post recovery geriatric care remote monitoring right which can reduce the burden on hospitals right that probably will be the next phase of growth along with let's say med devices right i mean not every hospital can afford let's say a very very expensive scanner but the indian version or or let's say the jugad version of let's say having a probably cheaper version with probably let's say 90 95% same efficiency i think those will uh, propel the next phase of growth and and let's say investments in in the country in healthcare right okay and with that i'd like to uh, thank my three panelists uh, thank you so much for this very enlightening session thank you, so thank you. Thank you.